In other HSU news, the Academic Senate has decided to go ahead and allow the prioritization ranking that has been set up last year to go ahead and uh, start the process of cutting programs. Uh, they voted 24 to 0, uh, an amazing vote, almost complete uh, unanimity in, in that decision. Pretty uh, disgusting, really, that they would go along with it. It would be a nice, uh, you know, piece of symbology to at least have all voted against it and made uh, Provost Snyder go ahead and be forced to do uh, uh, what he would have done anyways, but just cut the programs. Yeah, and show the true tyrannical nature of them, um, which leads us into our next story from the Times Standard by Donna Tam. HSU change panel calls for reform. Uh, throughout my experience as a student government uh, legislative affairs vice president and chair of student government, I was an academic senator at the time, and the Western Association of Schools and Colleges and Keeling and Associates has, has done an independent analysis of the university situation as well as the academic senate have all concluded that shared government is the best solution to most of the problems that are being suffered at HSU. And a university-wide senate is now proposed, but President Ron Richmond hasn't listened to HSU faculty opinion for a long time, which makes it a sore point for campus relations. Rawl and his administration have repeatedly received raises and praises during the worsening budget crisis and cuts at the university. Richmond has little and no confidence in him according to an academic senate ballot during my time in the academic senate. And uh, all concessions and negotiations have been later undermined by further budget cuts, uh, which ultimately lead, leads me to conclude that becoming an independent uh, entity free of the CSU is ultimately the solution to most of the problems the university has been suffering. And now for our state news, more on education. It's so another Time Standard article by Allison White. Education officials cry foul over governor's cuts. While HSU and the California State University System administration are paid uh, handsomely for their misleadership, uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger has developed a budget proposal he claims protects education, when in reality the proposed budget will actually cut $2.5 billion from the state's education funds. You can't cut as deep as that and not cut vital services, says Gary Eagles, superintendent of Humboldt County Office of Education. California now must fill a budget gap of nearly $20 billion. And uh, cutting school district administrative costs, encouraging schools to use contractors instead of hiring employees, and consolidating county offices are all on the table right now. Shifting gears a little bit to the Los Angeles Times, uh, state lawmakers take aim at free parking. Uh, basically, they are really upset about free parking. We have the Senator Alan Lowenthal, who's from Long Beach, and who's saying that there's too much of it, too much free parking. Uh, it's encouraging people to drive, and, you know, what a horrible thing. And he says that they want to put this bill in, which is going to provide uh, financial incentives for cities and counties to stop providing free parking on the street. Um, cities that take such action will get more state money than others. So basically, um, you know, that's criminal, first of all. We already pay tax money to build all the streets, to build everything. It should be first come, first serve as far as parking goes. Another uh, time standard story by Allison White is a bill to legalize, regulate marijuana, reintroduce to state assembly by the time standard. And this bill, known as AB 2254, is a preemptive strike by legislatures to regulate cannabis after the recent ruling which says that the state cannot manipulate propositions passed by the people of California. A $50 an ounce fee is proposed and restricting marijuana or cannabis smoking to tobacco zones only is uh, in the measure. This episode's featured documentary is Behind the Big News, Propaganda and the CFR. As usual, the documentary is found online for free and we'll have it posted on our blog at our website, unstackingthedeck.com. And this documentary deals with uh, the conspiracy, quite plainly, that exists to control and consolidate media power in order to push the agenda of a handful of people. And it's shown in the beginning of the documentary, they go through some examples of ways that the media uh, perverted the perspective of the people as to what happened exactly. So for example, during the Oklahoma City bombing when a young lady who was an informant, a uh, whistleblower that the government had foreknowledge of that attack uh, was suppressed from the press. 
And it also talks about Council on Foreign Relations, and we have a uh, clip for you now about this. The year is 1917, and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan Interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The 12 were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The 12 found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today, the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world and the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. One of the CFR's strongest media allies is the New York Times. As a major outlet for the establishment viewpoint, the Times has achieved dominant influence over the reporting of national and international news. The Times is relied upon by many editors in the mainstream news media for direction on how to portray world events. In addition, the Times Wire Service retails the establishment line to subsidiary outlets such as broadcast news distributors and regional newspapers competition between these outlets rests primarily on the style of regurgitating the same message. This episode's featured book is by Ben Bagdikian. It's entitled The Media Monopoly. Well, ben Bagdikian actually is pretty influential during the release of the Pentagon Papers, uh, so he's proved his valor in that sense, and this book has been written like 30 years ago and actually everything in it pretty much has come true in respect to the consolidation of media power and it goes uh, he goes about stating the dangers of consolidated media control and also how it's going to happen and everything is uh, that he foretold has come to pass one of the best excerpts from the book is uh, the following smaller independents have always helped provide an alternative and still do but they have become ever more vulnerable to the power of the supergiants as the larger firm uses its greater financial resources to undercut the independent editor on price and motion. In the process, consumers have become less influential than ever. Another excerpt is, Perhaps the most troubling power of the new cartel is its control of the main body of news and public affairs information. The reporting of news has always been a commercial enterprise, and this has always created conflicts of interest. The idea of government interceding to protect consumers is contrary to the ideology of most of the media's cartel leaders. 
who, with few exceptions, pursue the conservative political and economic notion of an uninhibited free market that operates without social or moral obligations. Which, of course, we're not in a free market at all because of the controls we've already explained about the FCC and who's allowed to broadcast, who's not allowed to broadcast. Uh, that's why things like what we're doing with an alternative news, uh, we don't have producers that own us, we don't have anyone that can tell us what we can and can't uh, broadcast, what news stories to carry. That's why supporting those groups is so important, that's why supporting groups like Access Humboldt uh, is so important and other independent outlets that are around the world. So please, we urge you to get Media Monopoly. It's an excellent book, and uh, you can find it probably for cheap online, get a used copy. Or, of course, go to your local library, and they should be able to uh, order you anything. Or a used bookstore. This episode's moment in history is discussing uh, the different roundtable groups which have been set up in this country and uh, throughout the world, really, which have used their influential uh, papers, the white papers they write, which get sent off to various editors of papers, publishers, and uh, heads of universities, uh, financial elites, in order to kind of dictate what policies are going to be written about, what news stories are going to be covered. And we want to focus on uh, these different groups here and tell you a little bit about them. As we revealed uh, in our featured book in our first episode, The Anglo-American Establishment by Carol Quigley, there was a conspiracy by the Anglo-American groups and roundtables to gain control of the media and public opinion, also education and other forms of media, in order to perpetuate the goal of reacquiring the colonies back to the British Empire. Yeah, they were basically working uh, the Chatham House and what eventually became the Royal Institute of International Affairs where they ran basically the Times. Everyone knows about the Times, the Times of London and everything. That was run by them for many, many decades, still is basically, by those same groups. And it's been that way with most large publications and journals uh, for at least the last hundred years. These uh, think tanks and various groups have come in and have taken over the editorship and uh, taken over many of the uh, producers, which is again really important, who is owning the group like General Electric owns NBC. They obviously have a conflict of interest there on news that comes out. Yeah, and GE has also created nuclear weapons and whatnot, so they have a specific interest in war uh, because they have a profit line that is actually dictated by the military industrial complex. So reporting on things that would escalate tensions and help create the basis for war, the acceptance of it in the American public is within their interest. And also while these wars and conflicts create the justification for revocation of our civil liberties and our rights, our inalienable rights, which we should never give up for any reason. Yep, these uh, different groups have been working pretty hard with all of the different media institutions to try and propagate different ideas and theories out to all of the different groups of people around the world. And this has served to, yeah, as Jason said, create fake wars, get people behind all kinds of ideas. The media is a powerful tool, and that's why it's really important that uh, individuals like yourselves and other people, um, us, we all need to get out there and try and uh, put our own voices out there so that just the corporations aren't talking, just the big governments aren't talking, but uh, we, the people, are speaking as well. And these controls are manifested not necessarily in one massive lurch but through small baby steps over history so this is not actually like a specific moment in history but there's been a multitude of different events which have culminated in a more complete control over our media systems as uh, the control over the editors and public opinion have been one of the major footholds that were gained and then upon that was built uh, all sorts of news coverage that's friendly to that kind of a voice. And there's been various um, you know, judges, uh, decisions that have been put out, legislation that's been passed which has uh, in recent years allowed corporations to have an even more dominant uh, hold where they can own uh, news stations and papers and magazines and all this other stuff in one community which would have been prohibited decades earlier. Uh, it's now allowed. Yeah, and, and chains, as Mr. Bagdikian in his book explained, uh, were expanded. You could only have maybe one newspaper, one radio station uh, that you could own, and now like you could own a massive amount of these entities, and there's no restriction upon it. 